it's my great pleasure to introduce Dan Lindsley to this series of Profiles in Discovery where we honor the great biologists at UCSD. Dan is a world leading authority in genetics and has been one of the great figures in the field of Drosophila biology for the past 50 years. Dan has been recognized by his work by receiving numerous awards, and perhaps most salient among those are his election to the National Academy of Sciences, his election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and receiving the T.H. Morgan Medal of Science from the Genetics Society of America. Um, Dan, perhaps we can start at the very beginning. And why don't you spend a few minutes telling us uh, what prompted you to pursue a career in science? Well, it's interesting. As a child, I was always interested in bugs. And uh, in fact, uh, started out as an avid butterfly collector, which I still am, by the way, and uh, intended to go into taxonomy as a uh, career. But at the University of Texas, uh, I was uh, introduced to genetics. That's when you were an undergrad? As an undergraduate, yes. And uh, a professor saw an interest in genetics in me. And uh, so he, a zoology professor, gave me a stock of flies that had five different mutations on the X chromosome and said, OK, make me a map of how these, these genes are distributed on the chromosome. <clears throat> well, I had no idea how to proceed, uh, except that uh, George Beadle came through and gave a Sigma Xi lecture about his work with Neurospora and mentioned that uh, the amount of recombination between genes is proportional to their distance apart on the chromosomes. And so I performed the appropriate cross and was able to prevent the professor, present the professor with a map. And he was quite uh, impressed and I was hooked on genetics. And uh, from that moment on, I was uh, uh, sure that I was going to go into genetics as a career. Tell us, and for the people in the audience which are not familiar of the extraordinary value of Drosophila as a model organism, what has made flies, as we tend to refer to them, and these are not the house flies, these are those tiny little flies that are often attracted to your bananas. So what, what has made fruit flies such a great model organism? Well, they're easy to grow. Uh, and they grow in a small space. And you can, make, you can produce large progenies uh, in a little vial. And it takes about two weeks per generation. And that plus the, the tr tremendous amount of information based on tens of thousands of years of person work uh, means that the organism is, is just very well, very well known. And some of the early, I mean, it's essentially uh, the first experimental organism after Mendel's peas uh, that generated a burst in interest in genetics and a burst in understanding of the way genes are transmitted from generation to generation and so on. And in Morgan's lab, the first mutation was discovered. And, in, and the first chromosome map was made by Sturdivant. Bridges, in 1916, demonstrated that genes are on chromosomes, which was not known until then. And later, Bridges showed how the chromosome constitution of the organism determines it's sex during development, that males have a different chromosome constitution from females. So all of these basic discoveries were made using Drosophila in the first decade during which it was studied. Then some years later, in 1927, Morgan, I mean, sorry, Muller, who was a, also a student of Morgan's, discovered that x-rays caused mutations. Before that, People just had to wait for mutations to arrive spontaneously. But more, Muller was able to show that x-rays cause mutations and chromosome aberrations. And then some years later, 
uh, during the Second World War, uh, Charlotte Arbach in Britain was studying mustard gas and showed that alkylating agents can cause our chemical mutagens. So with these two discoveries, uh, geneticists were, allow, were able to generate mutations almost at will, and that caused uh, an explosion of uh, work and understanding in, in genetics. Exactly. So, so let me take it from there. So indeed, it, there was a renaissance in genetics as a result of these fundamental discoveries. Now, let's try to now to relate these discoveries into transforming events in modern medicine and why to this date we rely on model organisms like Drosophila as a substrate to study things which are too difficult to do in humans but that they have a direct application to human disease and human well-being. So well, what specifics can you... The way I would would start that is to say that when life originated on this planet, uh, it was obviously very simple, very inefficient, but in order to continue, it had to be able to do a few basic things. It had to be able to take in nutrients from the uh, environment and to grow and to reproduce and to sense its environment and even in these very simple systems, those were a sine qua non of survival. And from that point on, uh, organisms uh, developed, become more and more complicated, but they didn't have to reinvent the wheel. They could take these simple abilities that were necessary for the origin of life and amplify and modify those so that as organisms became more and more complex, uh, the systems became more and more complex, but they all derived originally from this very simple beginning. And given this kind of a view, we see that mammals and insects derived ultimately from a common ancestor which was very distantly related to that origin of life. But they have the same physiological functions, flies and humans, and they use the same genes to do those functions, and so that if we can study those genes in the fly, we can make direct inferences to their function in humans and to their dysfunction in humans, which, is often which are often causes of disease. I, I, I often tell my students that, as far as I'm concerned, we're nothing but a big fly, meaning we people, because like you stated, it's is the very same players being choreographed in a slightly different way. Now, can you give us some specific examples of well, discoveries in flies that transform our understanding of human biology? Let me step back a minute and say that the basic understanding of Mendelian inheritance was completely fleshed out using fruit flies. And by the 1940s, that was pretty much established. And fruit fly genetics kind of hit a dead end because it didn't have the tools to go any further. And the interest in genetics turned to microbial genetics, viruses and bacteria. And it was in those systems that the basic molecular biology of genetics was established, the DNA, RNA, and protein and so on. And once these systems were well understood and well described in microorganisms, it was possible to apply this information to fruit flies. And so from 1940 to let's say 1970, the interest in Drosophila was at a very low ebb, but now with the application of molecular biology to eukaryotic organisms, that is organisms that have multiple cells and nuclei in their cells, Drosophila genetics again took off. And it's become a, a remarkable enterprise now with thousands of people working every year on Drosophila. Can you think of some tangible examples 
of discoveries in flies that have transformed our understanding of human biology. Human biology. Well, I think, I think uh, almost immediately of the logic of development. I mean, the fly starts life as an egg with a single nucleus, and genes get turned on in, that, in those nuclei and turned off in a, in a special uh, order in time so that one gene will be, be turned on and the next gene will start and turn it off and so on. And so we get a succession of timed gene activities which divide this simple egg into many subsegments and actually lay out the body plan of the insect in the first few hours of life. And the same logic takes place in all animals. And the same genes that do these jobs in the fruit fly do the same jobs in humans, frogs, mosquitoes, what have you. Another place where, where that's had a, a big effect, and it's still having a big effect because the problem is not solved, but when ner nerve cells grow out axons to particular targets in order to innervate them, innervate, uh, and the question is, how do they get there? What kind of cues do those uh, growing axons see in order to guide them to the proper cell at long distance from the original uh, cell body? And this is being studied in flies, and information is accumulating to give, to give clues, but it, there's still a long way to now, go. Where do you see now the field of both genetics and Drosophila going in both the near and perhaps the distant future? Well, the, the thing that uh, I'm, I'm most impressed with is, is that uh, the DNA sequence has been determined. The Drosophila has about a little bit more, a little bit more than 16,000 genes. Now, by the way, don't you about find half that, a human? Don't you find that extraordinary? The, the, the surprising thing is that uh, a human genome is only twice as complex as, as far a fly as genome. DNA coding capacity. As coding capacity is concerned, and uh, all. All, all, many of those genes are held in common. So that genes we learn about in, when looking at the human sequence, we can go back to flies and find that same sequence. Or if we have a very interesting sequence in the fly, we can find its counterpart in the human sequence. And so we can go back and forth. That allows Drosophila geneticists to do experiments with genes known to cause diseases in humans in the context of the fly without having to do complicated experiments with the human material. So it's a huge advance, and Drosophila is able to make uh, tremendous con contributions. And, and in fact, uh, in recent years, people have been able to take the diseased allele of a gene from the human genome and insert it into the Drosophila genomes so that that diseased gene is, human gene is acting in the fly. And then they can look at the, the problems that the fly has with that abnormal gene function and look at ways in which they can treat that function to give them some insights and ways to go back to the human system to treat it. Well Dan, it's been terrific uh, having you agree to be a speaker in this series and you've been a great friend and a colleague for the past 16 years and you've been a great figure to biology here for the 30 plus years and we look forward to your seminar. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. What I've, I thought I'd do is, is try to set the stage of what Drosophila has done for the science of genetics. And toward the end, describe some of the experiments that I've been involved in that Charles has already uh, mentioned.
But it was almost a hundred years ago that Drosophila became an object of genetic research, 1910, in the laboratory of T.H. Morgan at Columbia University. And the impetus was the discovery of the white-eyed mutant. And they immediately followed up on that and showed sex-linked inheritance. And then they realized that, yeah, you can get mutants. And so they <coughs> continued to look at lots and lots of flies and accumulate mutations. And they had a number of them that were sex-linked and uh, realized that you could actually, by looking at recombination between these mutants, make a genetic map. So the first genetic map was made by A.H. Sturtevant, who was eventually my Ph.D. mentor many years later, when he was still an undergraduate. <coughs> Several other things happened in that first decade. There were three very good students in Morgan's lab. Sturtevant, Bridges, and Muller. And Bridges did a marvelous experiment in which he showed that any time he got an abnormal segregation of genetic markers, he could look at the chromosomes of that fly and see that there'd been an abnormal segregation of the chromosomes, and thereby prove that actually the chromosomes are the carriers of the genes. Now, you don't even think about that question anymore, but in 1916, that was a big question on everybody's mind. And Bridges' paper came out in page one, volume one of genetics in 1916. Another thing that Bridges did was from triploid females, he was able to recover progeny of different chromosome constitutions and show that the sex of the progeny was related to the, rela to the ratio of X chromosomes to autosomes that they received. And so he established the genetic balance theory of sex determination. And that has held true uh, until now. One thing it did, though, it delayed the discovery of sex determination in mammals, which operates according to different rules, for a long, long time because people expected this generalization to apply to all forms of uh, higher organisms. In the 20s, inversions were, were discovered. Uh, crossing over in the four-strand stage was, was shown. And most important of all, in 1927, Herman J. Muller discovered that X-rays induce mutations. Up until then, all the mutations that they had accumulated had been spontaneous, and spontaneous mutation rates are very low. And Muller devised a scheme that allowed him to look at mutations all along one chromosome at the same time. In other words, he devised a scheme that he could recover a, an X-ray treated chromosome intact and then find out whether it had any mutations. And the mutations that he looked at were lethal mutations because they're quite common. And having an effective mutation screen allowed him to show that X-rays indeed cause mutations and furthermore cause chromosome aberrations. And so following that uh, discovery, uh, a lot of people jumped into the X-radiation of flies and all kinds of new things uh, began to come out. For instance, translocations uh, between two different chromosomes, deficiencies, things which hadn't uh, been around be <coughs> spontaneously began to be produced. Position effect was discovered. Furthermore, the fact that the chromosomes contained euchromatic regions and heterochromatic regions, which behaved completely differently, came out of these studies with X-ray induced uh, chromosome breaks. <clears throat> so I think that pretty much covers what the big things I want to say that happened in the 20s. Uh, in the 30s, uh, the next big discovery 
was polyteine chromosomes. Up until that moment, uh, all uh, chromosome studies in Drosophila were done with, uh, with mitotic chromosomes, which are very small and very hard to see. But as you know, the polyteen chromosomes in the salivary glands are about the size of your arm. Mm -hmm. and, and they're banded, and you can see a lot of detail in those. And as a matter of fact, uh, when people started trying to get physical maps uh, molecularly, the Drosophila said, we've already got a physical map. We don't need to uh, put contigs together. We can just uh, hybridize things onto the salivary chromosome, know exactly uh, where they are. Uh, the polyteen chromosomes were originally discovered by Heitz and Bauer, but they were not uh, working in Germany, but they were just uh, curiosities. And then Painter at the University of Texas found out that he could squash them out and he could actually identify the chromosome arms. And uh, when there was heterozygosity for a, a chromosome aberration, the uh, homologous, homologous chromosomes form particular constitutions, allow him to say where the breakpoints were that made those chromosome aberrations. And then C.B. Bridges uh, actually regularized the whole thing. He drew uh, detailed maps and gave every band its number and so on. So Drosophila was just going great guns uh, in the 30s. Uh, two other uh, phenomena that were discovered at that time that ha were, were used a, a great deal by a developmental geneticists later. And one of those was fate mapping by looking at mosaics and finding out how mosaic tissue uh, of one kind was distributed in the body versus <coughs> mosaic tissue of another kind. And the other was somatic crossing over, which allowed the production of spots of homozygous tissue in a heterozygous background so that you could look at the effects of, of uh, mutations which in, did not survive in the whole organism. So these things uh, were discovered in the 30s. They lay fallow, I would say, probably until the 60s, and then they were used a great deal. They're not used so much anymore because new technologies have uh, kind of made those obsolete. In the uh, early 40s, Charlotte Auerbach, working for the British War Office, discovered that mustard gas is a chemical mutagen. People have been looking for chemical mutagens uh, ever since x-rays were discovered to be effective. And she was the first one to show that mustard gas was, was a mutant. And that, and that paper didn't come out till later because it was highly classified uh, during, the, during the war. But of course, chemical mutagenesis has become one of the tools that we use all the time now. But it wasn't even suspected until 1946, I think, is when her paper came out. And the other thing that happened in the 40s was that uh, a book called The Mutants of Drosophila by Bridges and Brema came out, which was a compendium of the mutants that were known up until that time. There had been a couple of uh, works of that type uh, published earlier, one in uh, 1925 in Bibliographica Genetica, which was done by Morgan, Sturdivant, and Bridges. And then Bridges uh, published a little mimeographed DIS uh, version, which uh, sort of presaged the Bridges and Brema. Uh, Bridges died in 1939, and Catherine Brema considered, continued the publication of the book, and it came out. It was up to date as of 42 and came out in 1944. But genetics was changing. Uh, people were beginning to think that maybe DNA had something to do with genetics. Uh, <clears throat> I went to medical, I, the Navy sent me to medical school in uh, 1945, and I had a, a book called Physiological Chemistry, and it had four pages about nucleic acids. There were, was yeast nucleic acid and thymus nucleic acid, RNA and DNA. And they knew something about the structure, but they considered it a, 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 a repeating tetranucleotide 
monotonously repeating tetranucleotide, and they didn't quite know what it did, but they knew that nucleic acids absorbed UV, and they thought maybe it was uh, some kind of shield to protect the protein from incoming ultraviolet rays. So that was 1945. Uh, although people already were suspecting that DNA, I mean that nucleic acids were in, had a more important role, but the medical fraternity was unaware of that. Uh, but you know, that, that's about the time the transforming principle was found to be uh, nucleic acid, and that's about the time that the, uh, the reaction spectrum for mutation uh, at different, do different wavelengths of UV tracked the absorption spectrum of nucleic acids. There were various things that suggested that that was the case. And the other big change in, uh, in genetics was that Beetle and Tatum were studying Neurospora and were dissecting uh, the metabolic pathways. Neurospora being a, a, a prototroph which can make everything it needs from simple products, they were able to find uh, mutations that required amino acid, particular amino acid, or a particular vitamin or whatever. And uh, so they were be beginning that, and that, that was a, a very popular uh, subject of investigation during the 40s. I started graduate school at Caltech uh, under the aegis of Sturdivant in 1949. Sturdivant was my mentor, so-called, but I learned, uh, I learned genetics from a, uh, a research fellow there named Ed Novitsky. And Sturdivant uh, had a very distant view of students that w w we sort of basked in his, in his presence. I mean, he liked to talk, uh, but at the time he was interested in biogeography and fly taxonomy, and uh, my stupid little project didn't really interest him, and it doesn't really interest me anymore. <laughs> well, at Caltech at that time, Beetle was the chairman, and so Neurospora work was, uh, was pretty high in the, uh, in the order of things there. There are four or five people working on, four or five faculty members working on Drosophila. And Max Bel Delbrook was starting to, uh, uh, to establish bacteriophage as a very interesting system. And Luria was there, and, and Benzer was there, and Stent was there one time or another. And so that was very exciting, but uh, Novitsky was very disdainful of that, and uh, there unfor there, unfortunately, so was I which I now regret. Uh, but at the same time, Litterberg was showing uh, the, the, f the effect of mating in bacteria. And uh, also, just by the way, McClintock was, des was describing ACDS and, and transformation. So genetics was moving to the pro prokaryotic systems, and all the smart, the smart people were going into those systems. And Drosophila was not attracting a, a, a lot of devotees. So let's skip graduate school and go to 1953 when I was a, a postdoc. I spent the summer at Cold Spring Harbor. And that year at the Cold Spring Harbor meeting, Watson described the model. And it created a lot of interest, as you might well guess. And Delbrook and Luria were there at the time, as was Cy Leventhal, and so they had a little discussion group uh, t talking about this new model for DNA, and I sort of got to sit there and listen to them talk, which was kind of interesting. A friend of mine who was at Columbia at the time came to visit, and he was interested in nucleic acid, so I asked him what he thought about this model, and he said, well, he, he just considered another model, and he'd filed it away. So. Then I went to be a postdoc at the University of Missouri, and I told the people there about the model, and their reaction was ho-hum. So it, it, it didn't really impress everyone immediately. 
Well, as you know, once the, the DNA model was presented, then the work on that uh, exploded. And uh, semi-conservative replication was shown, uh, the, triploid, the triplet code was, was shown, and then the code was cracked. And uh, things were really uh, going great guns, and transcription and translation began to be understood. So what was Porter's Orthomus to do? Well, what I want to stop here now and, and ask the question, how many of these discoveries that I've just sort of passed over led to Nobel Prizes? Well, let's see who they were. I've got it here somewhere if I can read it. Uh, Morgan, 1934. Muller, 1945. Beadle and Tatum and Lederberg. Delbrook and Luria. McClintock. Nirenberg and Ochoa. And oh, I forgot. Watson and Crick. <laughs> Those discoveries, as you see, were, were monumental. Well, interest in Drosophila was at a nadir. Uh, the best minds were choosing prokaryotic systems, and uh, Stent even wrote a book called The Coming of the Golden Age, in which he said that biology has been cracked, and uh, now we can all become philosophers. <laughs> I talked to people in those, in those years who took courses in genetics that didn't even discuss diploids. It, it was all prokaryotic genetics. We had a national meeting in 1962 of Drosophila geneticists. Sixty people came. Now 1,500 come. Well, in 1954, I got a job at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where the interest was in radiobiology, but I wasn't going to be interested in radiobiology. I was going to do genetics. Well, there's radiobiology is in genetics, but one of the things that people were concerned about at that time was whether mice who were lethally irradiated but made to recover by the injection of bone marrow, recovered because of a humoral factor that was present in the bone marrow or the cells. And it was argued back and forth. Well, when I was a graduate student at Caltech, Ray Owen uh, had two strains of mice with different blood types. And he had the uh, reagents for uh, detecting those blood types. And so I got together with a friend there who knew how to handle mammals. And we wrote to Ray and asked if we could have those strains and the antibodies. Well, it turns out they were rats, not mice. But uh, we could still do the experiment. And so we lethally irradiated those, rat, irradiated those rats uh, in one, of one strain and uh, injected bone marrow from rats of the other strain. And then after they recovered from the irradiation, we did uh, quantitative hemagglutinins to see what the, what the red cells were. And lo and behold, the red cells were mostly derived from the donor, and not from the recipients. So it really was the cells that was rescuing those, those animals. Uh, it was the first de direct demonstration that, that was cellular. But there was already an indirect dem demonstration because some workers at NIH had shown that such recovered animals would accept skin grafts from the donor strain. So uh, ours was not first of first. Uh, I tried to continue working on. Uh, on mice and doing immunological studies and it just turned out that I wasted a lot of money and a lot of time and I just didn't have the talent for mice. So I decided that I loved Drosophila anyway, so what was I doing? So let me now 
turn to one of the two experiments that Charles uh, told us, uh, told you about in the introduction. And this has to do with the uh, search for mutants affecting meiosis. Uh, Larry Sandler and I had already had a number of, uh, of uh, good uh, collaborations, and he wanted to go to Rome. And he wanted me to go to Rome, and we wanted to find a project. So we discussed it a bit, and we s settled on this one to look for meiotic mutants. Uh, mutants that affected meiosis. I just want to draw the chromosome complement of Drosophila. Chromosome 2. Chromosome 3. Chromosome 4. And we were going to look for mutants in natural populations because recessive mutants are lurking in natural populations in fairly high numbers. And so, of course, it was the time of the Vendemia. We went out to the wineries. And they were just covered with Drosophila. So we could get all the Drosophila we wanted sometimes at wineries, sometimes down in the fruit market. And we, we brought in wild-type males, and we isolated from them a chromosome 2 and a chromosome 3. And we brought them into a genotype in which the X chromosome and the fourth chromosome were so marked that we could follow their meiotic behavior. And so we would and we would make these, uh, these uh, complements, these autosomal complements, which are 80% of the genome, we would make that homozygous in the way that we could follow the X and the 4. And uh, I forget the numbers, but I think we started out with 470 such complements. It took five generations to get to this stage. And from those, we got about 188 that were homozygous viable and female fertile, because both of those were required in order to follow meiosis. And from those, we only recovered five mutations. But it showed that this could be done. And uh, back in Larry's lab, after we returned to the United States, he had uh, Bruce Baker and Adelaide Carpenter looking for mutations on the X in a, in a similar kind of a setup, and they found them. And people have subsequently uh, used this procedure to find lots and lots of mutants affecting meiosis. And they use this procedure to find mutants affecting other uh, phenomena. Uh, they, didn't go to, they didn't go to natural populations anymore. They... Uh, they used EMS or x-rays or whatever. Uh, and it's, it's said, as Charles said, that this was a, an early case in which there was an attempt to uh, dissect a complicated multicellular organism's phenot uh, uh, process with genetics. We didn't consider it so. We simply considered it a fun thing to do and then a good excuse to go to Rome. <laughs> and uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing quite well. So I'll tell you the story. Uh, the first collection we made was in the fruit market, where all the farmers bring in their fruits to be distributed to the various uh, stores. And I was sweeping with a net, getting flies. And Larry, who fancied himself as a speaker of Italian, and he was very good, explained to the people that he's a little bit crazy in the head 
Uh, we, we bring him out here to let him wind down, but we're watching him, and he's, he's, he's not dangerous. Well, I didn't, I, my Italian wasn't that good, so I don't know if that's what he really said, but I've had that story thrown back at me a lot of times. When I was in Oak Ridge, there was a, uh, a postdoc from Italy there named Ferruccio Ritosa, and I don't know why we got talking about this, but I told him that I could generate a genotype that had one, two, three, or four nucleolus organizers. And that was sort of the end of that. But then he went uh, to work uh, at another year with Spiegelman and Atwood, and called me and said, gee, we'd like to have those strains. So, I mean, they didn't exist as strains, but I could put them together, and I sent them to them, and then they did the experiment, which showed that the amount of ribosomal RNA that the organism has is linearly related to the number of nucleolus organizers. And I think that's the first molecular biology done with Drosophila. And that's why I say that I was present at the resurrection because uh, after that, Drosophila began to take off as, a, as an organism for eukaryotic molecular biology. Another, another place where my knowledge of chromosomes came in handy was when Kavanaugh and Zim uh, were doing their famous experiment. I was able to give them chromosomes that allowed them to clinch their argument that the chromosomal DNA is one long, uninterrupted DNA molecule. Up until that time, that was a molecule of that immense length could not even be imagined. And there were lots of arguments about how a chromosome is made of segments of DNA interspersed by protein linkers. But this essentially put that to rest, and it also constrained how we could think about the phenomena of recombination and chromosome aberration. It had to involve DNA molecules and not proteins. So that's another, another place where Drosophila has uh, made a very important contribution to our, our understanding. Uh, All right, let's go to the segmental aneuploidy. That's uh, the one other experiment that I want to, uh, that I want to mention a little bit. Uh, what I have drawn here are two translocations, this one and this one, between the, an autosome, this autosome, and the Y chromosome. The, uh, the diagonal segments are from the Y, the, para, the uh, horizontal segments are from the autosome. So here's one Y autosome translocation with a dominant marker on this end of the Y and a different dominant art marker on this end of the Y. And here's another translocation in which uh, there's the do these two dominant markers and it's at a different place. I, I put these two f uh, vertical lines to indicate two different breakpoints along the chromosome. Now, what I'm going to do is a cross between these two lines. Okay, from, from this configuration up here, we'll bring these two at meiosis, these two separate from this one. And now, this one is going to separate from the other two and produce that. So now I've produced a, a constitution which is deficient for this segment of the autosome between, the two, uh, between these two regions that I've marked. And now to the other pole of meiosis goes this one. Okay, that one went up and now these two go up. And you see what's formed by the other product, products 
is an exact, a duplication for exactly the seg seg segment for which this is, uh, for which this is deficient. So this has one dose of this region, this has three doses of this region, and this is marked by two red markers, and this is marked by two green markers, so we can recognize them. And our idea was to produce a large number of Y autosome translocations, and then march down the chromosome, crossing adjacent pairs, to make duplications and deficiencies for the entire autosomal complement. And this was another thing that Larry and I dreamed up because we'd had so much fun doing the meiotic mutant one that we tried to find something else to do and this is what uh, occurred to us. And so my entire lab from La Jolla got into the car, into its cars four cars at least, I don't remember how, and we drove to Seattle for the summer. Larry had already x-rayed to produce the uh, y autosome translocations, and it takes two generations to look for the proper segregations to indicate that you have y autosome translocations. And so we combined forces with his lab, and we went through 8,500 F2 uh, generations and picked out about 460 Y autosome translocations. Well, it's not enough to have the translocations. Now you have to determine where the breakpoints are. And we did that by examining the salivary uh, chromosome, the polyteen chromosomes of every one of them. Uh, we started that in Seattle, but the fall quarter was coming. And so we came back to, uh, to La Jolla and brought the second chromosome once with us and we left the third chromosome ones in, in Seattle. And in that uh, quarter, uh, we finished doing the second chromosomes, and Bruce and Adelaide, who were graduate, Bruce Baker and Adelaide Carpenter, who were graduate students there at the time, finished the analysis of the third chromosome. So they were going to come down here for the, for the Christmas break. And so uh, we made the necessary crosses, to cross this one with this one, and this one with this one, and this one with this one, and so on, down the, uh, down the, the chromosomes. And, uh, oh, I should say, and I forgot to say, that this big push in uh, Seattle involved a lot of fly food. And two of our kids, made that fly food, so I think they need to be <laughs> acknowledged. Well, according to what I read in the paper that we wrote, uh, we made 6,885 pair matings between different translocations here in La Jolla in November, so that they were emerging during Christmas holiday. And we uh, uh, took over a student lab and about 20 of us sat in there and looked at the results of these matings. And we didn't know at the time how many deficiencies might survive. Uh, and there was just a little bit of fragmentary information that there were some deficiencies that were known to survive and they never got very big. And so uh, here are the results. Now let me explain this. Every one of these little vertical lines is a, is a Y, is a break point, tells you the break point of a Y autosome translocation. This is this two left, two right, three left, and three right. And the black places are deficiencies that survived. Oh, I, first I should say about the duplications. All the duplications survived. Every one of these segments survived in the duplication with one exception, this one. This particular region cannot stand to be present in three doses. And people are still fooling around with that and I don't think there's any answer yet. But the deficiencies 
As you can see, a very large part of the chromosome is black. That all of the, this, this deficiency, this deficiency, this deficiency, but some, for some reason not this one, but larger deficiencies including that did survive, so I think that's probably an artifact. But one thing we noticed, that let's say, for example, this, this deficiency which didn't survive. Well, we had two component deficiencies, each of which did survive. We had that case over and over again. Two small deficiencies which will survive in the heterozygous condition. The larger one that comprises both of them uh, will not. Now, it's been said that this was an early experiment in genomics. Well, I think that's a stretch, <laughs> but <laughs> at any rate, there it is. Well, uh, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the books. Uh, in 1963, we got a call from the Genetic Society's uh, Committee on Stocks, Stocks, which was headed by Ed Novitsky, asking if Ed Grell and I would be willing to revise Bridges and Brema. And in a weak moment, we said, yes, we'll do that. We'll try to do that. So we essentially locked ourselves in a room for five years uh, with a library right next door and went through the alphabet, went through the literature, finding every, uh, everything we could about every gene and every uh, chromosome aberration. And at that time, there were about 3,000 genes that we uh, identified and 1,500 chromosome aberrations. And that uh, book came out in 1968, the year after I got here. And so it took us, it took us five years. And uh, I, think it, I think it probably had a, a stimulatory effect on, on Drosophila genetics because at that time Bridges and Brema was out of print, you couldn't get a copy, and uh, was out of date. And so this pretty much brought things up to date. But, you know, the molecular biology of Drosophila are of, yeah, had started. And information was coming in hand over fist. And, and this thing that came out in 1968 was uh, outdated very quickly. And uh, we put off doing anything about it as long as we possibly could. Because the thought of doing that again uh, was, was daunting indeed. At the time of, of the first book, the only way you could know that you had a gene was if you had a mutation. And so there were just relatively few for which people had mutations of all the genes. Uh, and so there was a lot of, of new genes, and there were a, was a lot of information on the old genes that hadn't been published. And so Georgiana Zim and I, foolishly, undertook the job. Uh, I spent 10 years of my life on that, and I think Georgie spent 20. Because starting about 1970, she had already started abstracting the literature. And uh, getting out, just, she had notebooks full of uh, outlined papers and with the indication of what genes were discussed in those papers. Uh, and, uh, the, th the thing is that PCR had come along. P element mutagenesis had come along. In C2 hybridization had come along. All of these new techniques that just increased the amount of information available to the point where it was very hard to keep up with it. And uh, in 1988 or 89, we did not think we were ever going to finish. It was, it was coming in faster than we could digest it. So in 1989, we cut it off and stopped putting in new information. And we didn't get the book together until 1992. So there are the books.
Here's Bridges and Brema, called the mutants of Drosophila melanogaster. As you can see, it's well worn. This is the next one, genetic variations of Drosophila melanogaster by Lindsley and Grell. Uh, we, we included more kinds of things like triploids and comp compound chromosomes and things that weren't included there, so we thought it was more than mutants. And then with all the molecular information that had come along, we decided the genome of Drosophila melanogaster was the appropriate thing. And here's the uh, Lindsley and Georgiana Zim. So, as I say, that's many years of our lives. And uh, the genome of, of Drosophila has more or less formed the basis for Flybase, which is now uh, run by a consortium of a dozen people and is keeping the information up to date because, as you know, since 1992, so much has happened that this has got to be out of date now. But it's still very useful. It's nice to have a book on your desk instead of a computer. Uh, <laughs> well, we can't end this without at least a word about butterflies. <laughs> I mean, my love of butterflies predates my love of fruit flies. I like to tell people I like flies, fruit and butter. <laughs> so uh, Ethan got me a picture of some butterflies from, uh, from Sean uh, Carroll. I started collecting probably when I was about 12 years old, and I never, I never outgrew it. And uh, I've probably collected about 75,000 specimens in my life. Uh, not many are prepared, but uh, they're still lying dead in my closet. <laughs> uh, since I retired, uh, Gene and I have done a lot of traveling. We've taken a couple of trips every year. And this, well, it doesn't show so well, but those red dots give you an idea of where we've collected butterflies. Uh, and you can see that uh, that map is kind of measly. Uh, Asia is pretty empty. North Africa is pretty empty. South Africa is pretty empty. Uh, these two spots are kind of a lie because we're going there next month. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have one more slide which is here. Thank you.